6.30. So we'll call ourselves to order. If you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Eva Henry. Steve Odoricio. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Fanganello. Anthony Graves. Robin Kniech. Uh She's here, just out of the room at the moment. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Libby Zabo. Casey Ty, Bob Pfeiffer, John Marriott. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Larry Vidham. Here. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Here. And Justin. Here. Lynn Baca. Tara Radloff. Jeff Blue. George Teal. Jason Bauer. Doris Trular. Carrie Penaloza. Laura Christman. Richard Champion. Gail Christie. Rick Teeter. Here. Debbie Nasta. Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Here. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Here. Sarah Karis Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, TJ Gordon, Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Phil Cernanek. Present. Jacob Lofgren. Larry Strzok. Here. Wynn Shaw. Here. John Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Dan Greenberg. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Kyle Mollica. Jordan Sowers. Here. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Here. Rita Dozal. Here. Heidi Williams. Eric Montoya. Here. Herb Atchison. Here. Joyce J. Adam Zarin. Deborah Perkins Smith. Bill Van Meter. Here. And we have a question. And we do have a you know, we have a quorum. And uh, really appreciate that we keep that quorum through at least agenda item ten. Um Me so too. <laughs> So we do have one introduction to make, and uh, we have a, somebody that's here for the first time, as far as I know, the alternate for North Glen, Jordan Sowers. So Jordan, welcome. All right, uh, motion to approve the agenda. Mo uh, motion and second, all those in favor? Aye. Very good, agenda item five, which is under attachment A, Metro Denver Nature Alliance. Mr. Calvert. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's your lucky day. You actually won't be hearing much from me um, other than a very quick um, inter introduction. Uh, so you're actually going to be hearing from uh, Susan Daggett this evening. Some of you know Susan. Uh, uh, Susan is a uh, natural resources and environmental attorney and currently uh, the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute at, at DU. That's her day job. And Susan's also brought uh, some backup uh, uh, with, with Dana here. And so Dana may entertain some questions as well. Uh, um, so really, Susan's going to be here tonight to talk about um, and introduce you to a new coalition. And as, as the chair mentioned, there's actually uh, a memo and presentation in your packet if you want to take a look at that. <laughs> um, and the origin of this coalition can actually be traced back uh, to uh, 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 the annual conference of the of the institute that, that Susan puts on each year, and just a shameless plug on Susan's behalf, it is a great two days. Um, I know that planners around the region look very much uh, to, forward to the RMLUI conference um, each spring, and so 
take a look in March and see if it's something that aligns with your interest and make it a point to go um, as well. So um, they've been working uh, to sort of in the um, uh, the early stages of this coalition for the for the past few years, uh, evaluating national models of similar groups, sort of building awareness and, and identifying and uh, evaluating and working with uh, potential stakeholders and partners. And so I'm happy uh, that Susan can spend a little bit of time introducing you uh, to the Metro Denver Nature uh, Alliance. I will just mention as a brief uh, reminder uh, the MetroVision plan uh, that this board adopted back in January includes the following outcome. The region values, protects, and connects people to its diverse natural resource areas, open space, parks, and trails. Uh, so I hope when you hear what Susan has to say this evening, you see a significant amount of alignment uh, with that uh, outcome ad adopted by this group uh, and the work of the Metro Denver Nature Alliance. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Susan, and I'll give me two seconds to bring up your presentation here. And I will advance the slides on your behalf. Thank you. Well, uh, no, thank you for that introduction. And I would like to introduce my sort of partner in crime, Dana Coelho, Hello. from the U.S. Forest Service. Dana is um, in the Community Forestry Program. And as you will learn, the um, this effort really is a a coalition that is uh, a, a growing coalition. We have a group of folks who have been working over the last couple of years to really think about the role of, um, of a potential new organization in facilitating collaboration and providing an infrastructure for collaboration among government, local partners, business, nonprofit sector, neighborhoods, schools, you name it. Whoever's interested in connecting people with nature and making sure that we have a healthy, thriving community and a healthy, thriving natural ecosystem in this area and that those things work together as we grow. Um, so we have been um, focused for at least a couple of years um, with the, the, the slide shows the, the range of partners that are at the table at this point and we have spent the last um, couple of years focused on researching other models in other cities from Chicago to Portland, San Francisco, um, Baltimore, and other places, um, and really thinking about what it would look like in Colorado. And we have um, uh, put together, as of this summer, really, a draft strategic and business plan. We, um, in 2015, we started the conversations about what this could look like and what the role was. In 2016, um, we got some funding from Great Outdoors Colorado and from the Gates Family Foundation who recognized that although there were a lot of organizations doing great work, there was not really a regional vision. There was no place for those different groups to come together around a shared strategy. Um, and we've spent the last year or so doing partner outreach, having meetings to talk about what the role of this organization might be. and. Um, have taken some teeny steps into doing some projects together, including um, creating a decision support tool, which we supported Trust for Public Lands and putting together as a way to use GIS mapping to look at areas of potential collaborative work. We've done the Canoe Mobile, which is a local, um, was an effort to get kids out into nature from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, and uh, we have put together this strategic and business planning, which is in its draft stage at this point. And we are really at the very beginning effort of reaching out to the broader community to explain what we're trying to do, hopefully to get buy-in and support, um, and to offer up ways that different organizations might get in involved. Some of our models are um, the Portland Intertwine, which has literally 180 partners at the table with them, ranging from private companies to state governments, federal governments, local governments, and the nonprofit sector. So it's a big umbrella that um, would rely on, you know, a staff person or two ultimately to really bring all of this together. And it's it's providing that communications infrastructure as much as anything um, to help people align their work. Um, so the first step of our strategic planning process was to do a gap analysis. We interviewed 168 organizations, 31 coalitions. We sent out surveys. Um, and we um, gathered a whole lot of information. And what we heard was that there really is an important role that needs that somebody needs to fill around coordination and collaboration um, that we 
89% of our respondents thought that that was a really important role for, for us to play that was necessary. That there's an important role to bring folks together to think about a regional vision, the same kind of work that Dr. Cog does in this nature space. Um, that having a diversity and equity and inclusion kind of lens to that work was also very important. There are groups that are at the table often, um, and there are other organizations and groups and neighborhoods that often are not at the table and don't have an effective role to engage. And so part of our challenge is to figure out ways of being very inclusive in this effort. Um, and then a need for uh, public awareness and buy-in uh, for the idea of expanding our support for nature in general. So this is hard to see, but the, the roles that we have identified are facilitation, fostering collaboration um, and communication and serving as kind of an information hub and backbone organization for this effort. Um, being a champion for nature, so basically using a collective voice of everybody to align messaging and to elevate that message to the broader community. And then to support the partners through training and identification of best practices and um, helping to leverage resources for the partners. This is a super complicated chart that you don't need to read, but what it reflects is some thoughtfulness about what our theory is of change, what the inputs would be, how we, what kind of activities we would do in order to get to some very important outcomes. And those outcomes include greater prioritization of nature and land use planning, um, increased investment of parks, in parks and open space, stronger support for equity and access to nature, and then heightened engagement with nature among diverse um, communities. We established some guiding principles, um, inclusive alliance that we as a Metro Denver Nature Alliance would play a support role to the partners. We're gonna elevate and amplify the voices of the partners who are doing this work on the ground, whether that partner is Dr. Cog or a local government or a neighborhood group or a nonprofit of some kind. Um, that diversity and equity and inclusion will be integrated in our efforts. Um, transparency and decision making. So the goal is to have all of this information on a website that anybody can access um, and that we will be science-based and fact-based and, and that we will have used science and, um, and knowledgeable advisors to guide the work. Um, I talked about this a little bit. Our long-term outcomes really are about increasing our, recognizing that we are gonna grow tremendously over the next couple of decades. And if we're not intentional about preserving nature as we grow, um, we're gonna lose the quality of life that we all enjoy here. And so really our biggest long-term outcome is to make sure that we are increasing as a region our investment in nature and in the natural ecosystem and in people's connection to it. Um, so roles for Dr. Cog, um, and I'm gonna slow down a little bit here, and this is my last slide, so I really hope that you'll have a chance to ask some questions if you want. But um, Dr. Cog is a critically important um, partner in this effort, I think, and Brad has been, um, wonderfully generous in helping advise us so far and, and kind of sharing an interest in this general issue. But Dr. Cog, as our sort of regional entity focused on issues of land use, um, I think is a very important voice at this table. Um, as part of the steering committee to help guide the perspectives of the Metro Denver Nature Alliance to bring that regional land use and transportation perspective um, to this vision and to this sort of uh, planning process or program that we talk about, um, being at the table to hear what's happening and know what's happening and being able to translate a local government perspective to that steering committee is really important. Um, Dr. Cog and all of you as representatives of local government, I think have a really important role to play in translating what Metro Denver Nature Alliance is trying to do into local land use plans. I mean, at the end of the day, the vision and the strategy has to get implemented at the local level through land use planning, through land use regulations, and through local acquisition and creation of parks and trails, likely. And so the goal would be really, from our perspective, is to have 
Denver Regional Council of Governments at the table to help provide that bridge between local governments and the nonprofit um, sector that's trying to do this work. Um, so with that, I will stop and ask if there are any questions. Questions or comments? I have uh, Director Cernanek and then Director Brockett. Thank you, Susan. Uh, this is <laughs> Director Cernanek. So, um, with this, um, how do we contact you? Okay. I brought some business cards. <laughs> okay. Because, uh, I mean, I, I don't know who the 128 organizations were that you actually had. Um, I made a list of eight others mm -hmm. uh, that are not on that list okay. that I believe you should have some uh, interface with. Good. Um, and some of them are local governments or counties, and uh, some are <clears throat> conservancies that already exist that have done some levels of master planning, right. uh, so that you should be absolutely aware of them uh, to integrate some of that. So please. Right. Uh, absolutely. And so this, so we really are at this stage of, st of having um, done enough strategic planning at this point to have a sense for what where the gaps are in our community and what role we could effectively play. But it is now time to sort of open up the doors and say, <clears throat> everybody who's interested in this needs to come to the table. And we are planning, the way these things work is that they're ten, they, we're gonna plan for two summits a year where everybody comes to the table, participates, we'll have facilitated workshops around these topics, sort of a mini conference to make sure that we are bringing everybody together and having a, a way for people to engage uh, constructively together. So would love to get your lists. Other questions? Director Brockett. So a couple questions mm -hmm. for you. Um, the first, is, what's the geographic area that you're planning on working in? It's the Dr. Cog region. So one to one, Dr. Cog. Basically, yes. It's the, it's, I would say it's the Dr. Cog region probably plus the Denver Mountain Parks. Okay. as a Denver asset. But um, we, we debated this at some length and decided that it made sense to have co a contiguous boundary. It's the urbanizing area of Denver for all intents and purposes. And um, you know, the place where these issues are coming up the most is, is where there are, where the development and sort of natural systems are coming together and trying to figure out how to navigate some of those edges. So we definitely want, and, and then where the jurisdictions intersect. So um, part of the goal is to make sure that as we think about where we're growing, that we're, we're lay, layering in green infrastructure, habitat corridors, access to parks, that 10 minute walk framework, that you're thinking about all these different, you know, transportation, all of it together. And um, anyway, the Dr. Cog boundary just seemed to, it's an arbitrary boundary at some level, but it seemed to be the most rational boundary. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and have you uh, reached out yet to the uh, county and municipal open space departments? I have reached out to Heather Cronenberg, who is on the, Colorado Open Space Alliance and works in Westminster. And she's been involved in these discussions pretty much since the beginning on and off and um, has basically said, whenever you're ready, I'm ready to use my networks in the public open space programs to, to survey everybody and bring them together. So we've tried to make sure that we had the right, as we do this planning process, that we are including representative voices um, around the table, and she's the she is has been the sort of public open space voice that we have engaged nice. so far. So well, I expect there will be a lot more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as as we all know, so many of the cities and counties represented here have extremely active open space programs, and of course parks. So, so that's a liaison role. You highlighted that, but mm -hmm. we certainly can play. So, you know, I'm happy to put you in touch with the City of Boulder Open Space Department, you know, and I'm sure everybody else would be happy to do something similar because there's, of course, a vast amount of expertise and knowledge in all of those areas. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Director you. Atchison. Can you use your mic, please? Herb, can you use your mic? So, I understand you have a stack of business cards that you'd like to leave? I would. <laughs> Good. Well, I think you can give them to everybody. Okay. And you can always come through me as well. I, yeah, I'm, Brad knows how to read. Susan very easily. Director Jones. 
I just want to say hello and thank you so much for coming. And I think this is uh, an idea that not only would resonate with Dr. Coggs, but with all of our local jurisdictions. And I would echo, echo Director Brockett's um, invitation to connect with us locally. Mm -hmm. um, we just celebrated um, uh, Director Brockett's jurisdiction's 50th anniversary of their open space program last week. And uh, it was a lovely celebration and um, a lot of enthusiasm and expanding and continuing that legacy. So this would fit right with that. That's Lots great. of energy there. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you so much for having us. Agenda item six is report of the chair. I uh, have a few items. First of all, report on uh, RTC. Um, the items that we talked about at RTC yesterday morning are all on tonight's agenda with one exception, and that was the annual congestion report that was given by Robert Spots. And I won't go into detail because he will present that at a future board meeting. And everything else is already on the agenda. Uh, report of the P&E Committee, David Beacom. We've been somewhat focused the last few months, and it comes to uh, completion, well, hopefully tonight, but basically we've been working on the search and interviews and show, choosing um, a candidate to be the next executive director um, of Dr. Cog. And it's been all consuming for the committee and the subcommittee and we're ready to move on to the other things that the P&E committee uh, needs to face on that. Um, that's basically in a nutshell. Very good. Report on finance and budget. Director Dyack. Great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, tonight, uh, it was our second month of talking about the budget. Uh, what we did is we talked and uh, we're going to, we recommended approval. Uh, for the 2018 Dr. Cog budget to the board. The budget will be on the, the November board agenda for uh, our approval here. Uh, one thing I appreciate is the budget being aligned to the strategic initiatives. So if you have a chance, uh, take a look at the finance committee um, packet tonight or wait until the uh, next month packet so you can take a look at that. But we really appreciate staff's uh, attention to that and uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next and last thing was uh, talking about um, our uh, building lease negotiations. Uh, we had Sam Peasel come in. Uh, we're about 90% there for a letter of uh, interest, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we, uh, we talked uh, at nauseum about a lot of things, uh, from parking to, uh, I believe, charging stations, uh, Director uh, Partridge. So uh, <laughs> we've, we've covered the gamut. And, um, you know, I think uh, our committee feels comfortable uh, for uh, Interim Executive Director Rex to uh, sign that uh, LOI. And hopefully we'll ha have uh, more information forthcoming next month. Questions of the committee chair? Next, we have open interest in serving as board officer or nominating committee. So a couple of items on this. Um, in the next day or two, a form will be coming out that you can use to fill out your uh, desire to serve as a board officer. Um, so keep an eye open on your email, that'll come out and you can uh, fill it out and send it back to Connie expressing your desire to serve as a board officer. And then on the nominating committee, uh, what you need to do on that is email Connie and let her know if you're interested in serving on the nominating committee. So that's those two items. The last item I have is at your uh, place, there's this little flyer here for a Water Now Alliance event that's going to be happening here in Denver. Mm -hmm. It is uh, put on by CML Water Now Alliance and Denver Water. Uh, there are several local municipal elected officials that are on the Water Now Alliance, including myself. Uh, there was a, a one-day uh, symposium in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, Fort Collins. Boulder and Aurora were represented at that. And this is just kind of a, one that they thought that since it's going to be here in Denver, they were hoping that we'd get more activity from other local municipalities. And as you can see, communi communicating with ratepayers is, is the topic. So they would like to have 
as much involvement from elected officials in the area as possible. So if you can fit it into your schedule, I would encourage you to do that. Agenda item seven, report of the executive director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a number of items this evening. The first I would like to point out the other piece of paper that's at your placement. I don't know where mine is, but um, that one. Yeah, thank you, sir, very much. Um, we are offering a mini course tomorrow afternoon. Um, it, this is a new partnership with us. It's with SIPA, the Statewide Internet Portal Authority, and their stated goal, quite frankly, is to help you all with, with your websites, and it's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's a state state authority, and, and it's, it's free to you all. So I really would encourage, particularly the smaller communities, um, this might be a tremendous opportunity for you, for, for you guys. It's, um, uh, sign up is light right now. Uh, we are going to continue forward with it, uh, but I'm going to sweeten the pot a little bit because tomorrow at noon, our own director, Steve Conklin, is uh, going to be the guest speaker of ours at our, uh, at our monthly uh, lunch and learn, staff lunch and learn. And uh, he's going to he's going to talk about the going to be telling some tales of the heyday of radio in the Denver region. I thought I, you were encouraging people to come. <laughs> <laughs> no, when we were on one of our tours, one of the tours of the proposed uh, building relocation sites, um, Steve and I were start talking to Flo, and Steve got a tremendous history of radio in this region, and I'm sure he'll tell the story. I won't I won't steal it, Steve. I'll just tease it. That um, of how the ra a radio station saved the iconic Daniels and Fisher ta uh, clock tower in in, uh, in downtown. So, so everybody's more than welcome. Please, please bring your brown bag lunch, and uh, would be would be happy to uh, to find you a seat. Uh, and given that it's uh, it, it, the history of radio, is it going to be captured for a po pro podcast for later broadcast? <laughs> seems <laughs> seems appropriate, doesn't it? Um, we're still getting a lot of attention from other regional councils throughout the country. Um, since we've last met, I've sat on a couple of panels. Um, one last month, right at the end of last month, I sat on a panel with RTD and Mobility Choice uh, representatives Don Hunt and, uh, and former uh, Lone Tree Mayor Jim Gunning at Mile High Stadium. Um, and this was orchestrated by Austin, Texas, their, their Chamber of Commerce. I went in that... I w <laughs> First of all, going to Mile High is pretty cool. Being a Chiefs fan, I'm not invited there much anymore. Seeing we beat y'all last year, but um, but when we went in there, I was directed. This lady was bringing me back there, and I I thought it was going to be like 10 people, right? It was 120 people, and I said, Oh no, the Austin Group. And she said, This is it. And I guess that's how they roll in Texas, right? So that was kind of cool. And then um, then on October 2nd, Indianapolis MPO was here for a couple days. They were in our office for the better part of a full day. Um, and that was a smaller group, about eight or nine uh, elected officials and staff, just to talk about our planning process and, and um, basically really wanted to find out what the secret ingredients were to uh, good collaboration, which we did not share. I've also been on a little bit of a university speaking tour here the last week. I, uh, I uh, presented at a um, civil engineering class at the School of Mines, Colorado School of Mines, and uh, also uh, Will Tor's class. I know many of you know Will Tor, former former uh, Dr. Cog board chair. Um, his, he has an environmental science class dealing with sustainability at CU Boulder. So that, that was pretty cool. And although I probably lowered the IQ of the room significantly, I uh, I think we had a good good conversation in both of those. I'll tell you, we got nothing to worry about. There's some smart kids coming up. I can guarantee you that. Um, way to go, Tober. Uh, kicked off a couple weeks ago, and um, this is an annual challenge. It's the third year now, I believe, that we've, we've been doing this, and um, it's a challenge amongst employers to uh, see whose employees can be the biggest, can have the biggest mode shift away from driving alone. We have 50 plus businesses within this region that are competing this year, including uh, Dr. Cog. Um, and the overall leader is a company called Imagine out of Lafayette. As we uh, at the end, based on the points at the end of last week, um, Doctor, we're also doing well. We're in a different category than Imagine, thankfully. But we're uh, we're uh, we're now second in our pool, and we have 50 plus registered with staff uh, with uh, in this competition. We've saved 1,200 miles of SOV travel. And it, which equates to about 308,000 uh, pounds of savings in uh, CO2 emissions. So it's all pretty cool. We were, I think everybody's really enjoying it. 
Uh, Dr. Cog is also working with CDOT in, and communities around our state to organize a statewide um, winter bike to work day. Uh, you know, what did I say? I said, win no, winter. No, true, winter. Yeah, and everybody knows about our summer one. But, uh, so we're working on a winter one, too. And uh, it's, uh, we have an agreed upon date. It's February 9th. So, uh, so gas up those nub tires or whatever, <laughs> those big balloon tires, and hopefully we can get going here. Um, so we're really taking the lead on this, and we're pretty excited about it. But it's, it's nice working in partnership with the state, no doubt. We're also very happy to announce that Dr. Cog's staff is, is working with the town of Bennett. Um, uh, on, on, in, in using our uh, Dr. Cog Boomer Bond uh, assessment tool, um, which, is, which is primarily used to engage town staff and community partners in a conversation on the issue of becoming more age friendly. And we were working hard and we'll be working now through the, through the beginning of part of next year to get this thing going. Um, but uh, we're always looking for new participants. So if you're interested and have not done so yet, I would strongly encourage it. I would say anybody who's gone through that program well, would be big supporters of that. So if you have any questions, we can, we can give you references. Last but not least, uh, last week Dr. Cog wrapped up a course uh, that was offered through the Academy of Lifelong Learning. Uh, our very own Brad Calvert has been actively involved in that and worked on the curriculum for, for, this, for this group. Um, which was entitled Future of the Denver, Future of Metro Denver. It's a five-week course, and throughout that time, Dr. Cog and several of our partners uh, presented it to this group of about 65 participants. And we talked about everything from fast tracks to our growing demographics, housing challenges, all you know, all that kind of good stuff. So it's uh, it went extremely well by all accounts, and I'm sure we'll be asked to participate in the future. With that, Mr. Chairman, I am done. Very good, thank you. Agenda item eight is public comment. Uh, we allocate up to 45 minutes for public comment. We do ask that there be no comment on uh, items which the um, we've already had a pub prior public hearing. Each speaker will be allowed up to three minutes. So if there's anyone in the audience that would like to address the board at this time. Seeing nobody, we will move on to agenda item nine, which is uh, the, basically the consent agenda is just the minutes of the September 20th, 2017 meeting. Any changes, additions, deletions? I would entertain a motion. Discussion? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? All right, on to our action agenda. So agenda item 10, I'm going to turn over to Director Atchison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Roxy, you quit disappearing on me. <laughs> Stay there. Uh, as, as David talked about a little bit earlier, the P&E committee and the subcommittee and the negotiating committee have been spending a number of days and weeks on the action that we're going to be taking in a few minutes. A lot of time and effort went into a lot of nationwide search, reviewing a lot of very highly qualified people, getting down to a final four list, going through that as well. And then a very grueling and arduous negotiating meetings with the proposed director, which drug on for minutes and minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would be remiss, especially thanking David Beacom and Steve Conklin, who helped through all those committees uh, right up to the end. I appreciate the work they did and the time and effort they put into it. But most of all, Roxy Ronson deserves a great come back in here. <laughs> you quit hiding. Roxy has been with us since the beginning, and she did the yeoman's work on this. But uh, having that inside staff, uh, Roxy's been through this before, helped with the selection of the uh, consultant that we used, EFL, with Dan Cummings and stuff. I am very proud to read, as I have been instructed verbatim by the attorney, the following motion. I move to appoint Douglas W. Rex as Dr. Cog Executive Director to serve at the pleasure of the board with the officers of the Performance and Engagement Committee to sign the employment agreement per the Dr. Cog Articles of Association. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? 
Director Rakowski. They didn't hear you, Ron. I move that the motion be passed unanimously. <laughs> we, that's uh, part of the reason we were counting heads earlier is because we had to have 30 here for this. Uh, and we have more than 30. I think we have 36. So 34. So we're, we are good to go. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions, unanimous. <laughs> Congratulations. Ed. Well, all right. So, so I, I gladly turn the mic over for a few moments to our new executive director, Doug Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. No, I, this is... I mean, seriously, this is truly an honor. I mean, I, I remember almost th four years ago, to this day, I stood up here and told you about what Dr. Cog is. Because you guys don't know, right? I mean, because you guys, you are, you are it. But, you know, coming from, this is the fourth council of governments that I've been part of. And um, this is a special place. I mean, now to have an opportunity to be your executive director is pretty darn cool. I won't mind telling you. Um, but I understand it, uh, it comes with a lot of responsibility, too. And you're not offering this contract for me to just walk around and do nothing. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm truly blessed with the, this opportunity. Um, I will say, and I also, quite frankly, honored with the confidence that you have in, in me to do this job. I'm, I'm, I think it's pretty cool. I would, and I would be remiss if I did not mention the staff upstairs, um, particularly senior staff. They've been tr tremendously patient with me over the last over the last year. You know, typically, you know, well, normally. They've been patient with me. So you hear this little rap on my door, right? And it's like, Doug, I know you're busy, but if you get a chance, can you approve timesheets? You know, and that'll come an hour later, the same thing. You know, a year ago, before I was acting, be, Doug, no one's getting paid if you don't do your timesheet. You know, those types of things. So I really do appreciate it. And we have senior staff have been tremendous. I mean, the basic fact that it's very difficult, right? I mean, you guys know I've been working a lot. But they've also been working a lot. And it's very difficult to be able to work in an environment where you're not sure what the direction of the agency is. And it's, uh, I think they've done just unbelievable work and I'm so, so very honored to work with them. I copied down a couple notes. I did have a few things. Um, no, I also, I mean, I'm obviously very excited about this opportunity and I, I hope I don't disappoint. But if I, but it won't be from the lack of effort, I can tell you that. And I've talked about, you know, in various interviews and whoever will listen to me, this, this agency is about collaboration. It's about partnerships. And it's not about partnerships just for the sake of Dr. Cog branding. It's because those partnerships offer something to this agency and in turn offer something to your local governments. So that is the one thing that is the biggest challenge for this agency, to reach out and embrace as many partnerships as we can. So that's, that's something I'm really, really going to make an effort to do. And my, my biggest goal is, um, is to make basically this, this Dr. Cog, amongst your many committee appointments and that that you guys divvy up and everything, to make this a premium gig for you all, right? I mean, I know I've heard the stories about, you know, this is the, it's the new guy that gets the Dr. Cog um, appointment, those types of things. But I, I, want to turn that, I want to turn that boat a little bit and make this one that people are fighting over to get. And uh, because it is truly, I think once you get here, you realize how special this place is. And, and uh, so hopefully we can, we, can, we can make that happen. So with that, thank you all very much. I hope you feel you can pick up the phone at any time and call me day or night. That's why I'm here. Um, I know you guys are not shy, I know that. So, so please do. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn the mic back over to the chairman. Thank you. Well, I feel sorry for agenda item 11. Uh, agenda item 11 is under attachment D, uh, discussion of the removal of uh, NHS designation. Mr. Rieger. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I have the honor and the burden of following my supervisor, the new executive director. Congratulations, Doug. Um, there's no way I can follow that, and I'm, attempted, I'm tempted to just take advantage of your good nature and just ask for a motion and sit down, but uh, <laughs> I can't do that. 
<laughs> can't do that. Um, uh, we have uh, City of Denver staff here, and, and in uh, respect for them, I want to give them a chance to speak. I do want to give just a little bit of background um, on this item by way of introducing uh, Denver staff, because it's really their request um, to us. The motion that's before you tonight via resolution is to concur with the City of Denver and Denver Aviation's Department's request uh, to remove a portion of Pena Boulevard from E-470, so east of E-470 to the airport terminal uh, from what's known as the National Highway System, or NHS. Um, so I won't belabor the background, but just simply, the NHS is a federally designated system of the nation's most important roadways. It's the freeways, the interstates, the tollways, um, you know, major arterials, U.S. highways, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and what Denver is asking for, as I said, is to remove this portion of Pena Boulevard. And in a moment, I'll turn it over to staff so that they can give uh, their rationale why they believe that this benefits both the city and the region. Um, they put a lot of thought into this. Uh, but in terms of our role as Dr. Coggin as the MPO, this is really following the MPO process. Um, the rules here are any modifications to the National Highway System or NHS. There's a you know, sort of routinized procedure that's put into place by, uh, by our federal partners that say that, you know, they ask that these requests come to um, us as the MPO, um, and the City of Denver has done that. They went to our Transportation Advisory Committee in September, um, got a recommendation uh, to go forward there. Um, they spoke to our Regional Transportation Committee yesterday morning, um, had a good conversation, um, and again got a motion to come forward here. So um, if you approve the resolution tonight, what will happen is that we package uh, some materials that we received from the City of Denver supporting their request. Uh, we will actually bundle that together with the resolution, send it to CDOT, um, who will add a couple things, and then that entire submittal goes to FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, who is the ultimate uh, sort of approver of these types of uh, NHS modification requests. So just to orient you of what's in your packet on this item, um, there's a map that the City of Denver provided, again, showing where this section is. Again, it's a section of Pena Boulevard, um, east of E-472, the airport terminal. Um, what's known as a statement of justification from the city, this is something that's required um, by FHWA, which basically just lays out the rationale of, you know, why this request is being made. Um, there's letter and exhibits from the city of Denver um, that, again, sort of support um, lots of good background information that support their request, and then, of course, the draft resolution. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Rachel Carr, who's the federal policy advisor um, at Denver International Airport. Thank you, Jacob. Um, uh, I'm Rachel Carr with the Denver International Airport, um, speaking to you this evening about the City of Denver's request um, on Pena Boulevard. And as Jacob mentioned, uh, we're seeking removal from Pena East, the, the portion from E-470 East into the terminal. And for purposes of the conversation, we'll talk about the portion of Pena Boulevard from E-470 West to I-70 as Pena West. Um, earlier this year, we learned that Pena East was on the NHS. Um, and as you know, that means we're eligible for federal funding, but it also comes with a host of uh, restrictions, um, all new information to us. And this came on the heels of um, a contract that the airport had to build a welcome sign on Pena. FHWA um, contacted us after that to talk about the designation and what implications that that had for the airport. And so since that time, we've resolved any issues that the welcome sign might have had with being on the national highway system, but had to step back and look at the larger implications of what this designation meant for the airport and for our development along Pena Boulevard. Um, and there's two primary reasons that we are making this request and believe we have a really good case for FHWA uh, to consider. And one is just the unique history and character of the Road. It was built in uh, 1995 on airport property um, and with exclusively with airport revenue. So in its 22-year history, it's never been a recipient of any federal financial assistance um, uh, strictly paid for by the airport. So this, um, over the past 20 years of the airport, we really consider Pena East the driveway. So it's not um, an intermodal connector, but it's part of our facility and an important part of our facility. So once you hit that E-470 interchange, you have to start looking for, are you looking for the rental car facilities or the cell phone lot? Like that is all our property. And um, as such, uh, never having been a recipient of federal funds and being on our property, we believe the designation um, is not warranted. 
Uh, the second reason um, concerns the implications that I mentioned earlier about the restrictions that it comes with. And those for uh, what we're concerned with are the development, our ability to pursue commercial development along Pena Boulevard. We have a, um, we sit on a large uh, plot of land and we have some important commercial development development initiatives and part are right on Pena East. And so the, the designation would prohibit all those efforts. And this is significant because some of the, uh, F, the, some of the plans that we have that would be um, prohibited would create uh, significant non-aeronautical revenue for the airport. And by law, all of, the airport, all of the revenue we would generate from any development here would be um, pumped right back into our facility. And as you know, in this fiscal climate, we can't rely on heavy federal investment anymore for infrastructure. And so this we see is an important source of revenue. And um, for that reason, think the removal of the road would benefit the city, meet the needs of the airport, as well as the region. Um, I'd like to also mention that uh, what we're doing here is consistent with our overall approach to funding Pena Boulevard. Uh, right now, we're allowed to pay for 100% of uh, Pena Boulevard East, but we're required to seek outside funding sources for Pena Boulevard West. And so um, by removing the designation on Pena East, we will be able to pursue the development we want while in, um, preserving the eligibility to receive federal funds in the future for the portion of Pena West. Um, so far, we've, uh, this has been non-controversial, and we've had uh, bipartisan support from our delegation in Washington. So um, we appreciate being here tonight to speak about this, and it's really important for our airport. And um, it's been a deliberative, a long deliberative process, different, weighing in different things um, and our options, but uh, we believe this is the best path forward. And um, with that, I will open it up if anyone has any questions. So I'll uh, just add real quick that um, when uh, Ms. Carr presented this to us yesterday morning, there were some questions and we asked her to respond to those fairly quickly and she did uh, before the day was out. So we really appreciate your response to those questions from uh, directors Atchison and Rakowski. Uh, questions or comments? Director Atchison. Thank you. Uh, as, as the chair said, we spent a good bit of time at the RTC yesterday going through this, and thank you very much for the quick response. Uh, I think that the way we ended up was we had a majority approval. We had two people abstain because they weren't ready to make the vote. But what I would tell you is that I believe they answered every question that we had. I think the response we got was fully detailed to the, to the answer to the questions that I had, and I would recommend approval of the application. Is that a motion? No. Director Stoltzman. Thank you. I make a motion to concur with the request of the City and County of Denver to remove the National Highway System designation from a portion of Pena Boulevard east of E-470 to the airport terminal. We have a motion and a, se and a second. Discussion? Director Kanich. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I was just curious, and I don't know if folks need this information, but it, if, if they do, either, you know, whether we ask Rachel now or whether folks want to follow up, but understanding why we have been required to seek federal funding in the western portion, just to help understanding the difference between the west and the east. So I just, I flag that as something if folks feel like they need to lead, learn more about to either flag it now or follow up with Rachel, because I think they're really very two distinct roads. We're focused on an action related to the east side tonight, but if you want to understand the distinction, just to please, you know, use, consider Rachel or, or, you know, Anthony or I as a resource on that. Thank you for that. Other discussion? Director Partridge. You know me a little levity. This is way too tense. Does this come with possibly a changing of the color of the eyes of the horse statue? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sometimes you go too far, sir. You go too far. You know, I, I've always disliked that myself, but our Art and Public Places Director in the City of Aurora always tells me art is supposed to elicit comment and conversation, and it certainly does. <laughs> Not necessarily positive. <laughs> Other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. 
Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you very much, Ms. Carr. Thank you. Agenda item 12, we have a discussion on Dr. Cog TDM set aside, led by Ms. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everyone. I'm Emily Lindsay. All right, let's get this up. You probably, if you could get a little closer to the mic. All right, yes, Thank sorry, you. I'm a little shorter. All right, so I'm here to talk about the transportation demand management set aside of the transportation improvement program, and this is for fiscal years 2018 and 2019. Um, well, let's get started. So this is an existing set aside from the 2018 to 2021 tip. The overall set aside is just over $2 million. Um, and within this existing set aside, about 800,000 is reserved for small infrastructure projects. The remainder is for non-infrastructure projects. Uh, for this call for projects, for both categories of projects, small infrastructure and non-infrastructure projects, the minimum by project is 800, or sorry, 80K, the maximum 300. There is a little bit of additional funding potentially available and that'll be based on project closeouts and any savings from prior calls. That amount will be determined kind of at the issuance of the call for projects. I mean, and that number again, like I said, is based on the closeouts. So we'll know that when we issue the call for projects. Um, but we're looking at that number, you know, just over 2 million. So the kinds of projects that this set aside will fund are infrastructure and non-infrastructure. And in the infrastructure category, we're talking about small infrastructure projects uh, with that project maximum around 300K uh, that will fund bicycle parking projects, pedestrian and bicycle travelways. So that's some small trail projects, sidewalks, uh, protected bike lanes, that kind of thing. Um, bike share, bicycles and stations, and some wayfinding projects. And then on the non-infrastructure side, uh, there's innovative projects, education, marketing, and outreach projects, transit fair programs, and new TMA startup funds available. So we don't have to go through this, and it's a little hard to see, but we're kind of at the beginning of this process um, and looking at the set-aside rules and selection process, that, that top bullet. And we're in that second box right now um, with you all. Uh, but after that, Within the coming weeks, we're hoping to issue a call for projects and go through the project selection process after that. Um, and then Dr. Cogstaff, with the help of a project selection committee, will score and review and select those projects. And then we'll bring all of those, that recommended list back through the TAC and to the board for your overall approval. So this will be back. So some of the key changes, you'll, if you remember from the last time around, you'll see that the rules were rewritten to be a little more consistent with CMAQ, which is Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, which is a federal aid fund type. Um, so that was done with input from the Federal Highway Administration. Just to be more clear, so we didn't get into any situations where um, applicants were submitting project proposals that wouldn't get reimbursed. So we just wanted to be really clear with everybody from the start. Um, clarification that incentives of any type are not eligible was underscored. I think, again, we just wanted to be clear from the beginning. Um, let's see. We updated bicycle, pedestrian, travelway project funding guidelines so that they're the same. The 80 minimum, the 300 maximum. So they're the same as all the projects. We removed the transit proximity requirement for bicycle pro parking projects, so they do not have to be within a quarter mile of a transit station. They can be, you know, at a library, uh, at a civic center, they can be anywhere. Um, and then we clarified operating expense eligibility by project type, and you can see that in um, the car share section, and then in the bike share section, and TMO new startup funds. So another attachment talks about the evaluation criteria. Um, and you can see that, I believe it's attachment two. Um, like I said, this, the projects are selected with the help of a project review panel, and these are made up of non-applicants and TDM experts. Um, and they help score the projects with the assistance of Dr. Krog's staff, who help out with some of the more data-driven uh, population employment kind of basic statistical 
inputs. All right, so that was very quick, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. Questions or comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Move. Have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda item 13, attachment F, is going to be second year project delays. Mr. Cottrell. Thank you and good evening. So the adopted TIP policy states that project phases uh, that are delayed for a second year um, are allowed to appeal to the board for a variance to continue and if that phase is still delayed and therefore not initiated by October 15th. Um, if you look in your packet, attachment one contains the adopted TIP policy um, outlining project delays. So Dr. Cog staff has reviewed all of the project phases that received a project a first year delay last year in 2000, 2016. And after consulting with uh, CDOT, RTD, and the project staff, um, it has been determined that three projects are continued to be delayed uh, and were not initiated by October 15th. The three projects that are receiving a second year delay include the real-time transit signal project sponsored by Boulder County. Uh, this project provides public information display signage at multiple bus stops and park and ride locations throughout their county. The project phase that is delayed for a second year is construction, meaning the project would have to go to add, advertise for construction to not be delayed any longer. The second project is upgraded traffic signal equipment for the Denver Central Business District, district sponsored by Denver. Uh, this project will update and upgrade signalized intersection equipment to Ethernet and install power supplies within the CBD. The project phase that is delayed for a second year is design meaning the project would have to issue a notice to proceed to their consultant to not be delayed. The third project on this list is the 112th Avenue Corridor Improvements, sponsored by North Glen. Uh, this project provides bike, pad, and trail improvements surrounding the future Fast Track Station at 112th in York, as well as operational improvements along 112th. Um, there's two phases, or two project phases that are delayed um, for the second year, and these are environmental and design meaning these projects, these phases would have to have a notice to proceed for each phase um, issued to a consultant to, to not be delayed any longer. Uh, as outlined in each of the letters included in attachments two, three, and four, uh, each sponsor does wish to continue their project and appeal to the board. Um, the policy outlines two options for the board uh, to consider for each project this evening. Um, the first option would be to deny their appeal any unspent federal funds allocated for this phase in 2016 would be returned back to Dr. Cog for eventual reprogramming. Uh, the second option within the policy is to allow a variance of up to 120 days from October 1st, uh, and this would take us to January 29th. And if that deadline is not met, not met, all the federal funds for that phase would be returned back for re reprogramming. And finally, staff recommendation is to approve each project 120 days of a variance. And at this time, if the chair would allow, is to give each project sponsor the opportunity to either comment or uh, be available to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And uh, I, Mr. Cottrell outlined the uh, process, I think, extremely well. So uh, we will start with the first one on the list, Boulder County. Good evening. Uh, this is it off there you go uh, Scott McCary Boulder County um, so yeah this project is to basically install video monitors around transit stops that provide real-time information um, of when the bus is arriving and um, we back in May when we applied for funding for this program we thought that we were going to be able to piggyback on a RTD program so they were designing the US 36 BRT um, public information display systems turned out that they had quite a few major technical issues with um, installing those um, communication-wise, electrical and so forth, even wind, wind loads for the signs. We were kind of waiting for that to kind of settle out so that we could piggyback on that contract, and that never, never quite happened. Um, it came to both RTD and Boulder counties understanding that it wasn't worth pursuing that contractor and expanding the RTD scope of work. So 
that was part of the delay. Um, I think part of the other delay is um, part of the CDOT or requirements um, is that they they require a general contractor to oversee all constructions, and I think that works pretty well for more traditional type of projects like a sidewalk project where you have a contractor that needs to coordinate closely between say traffic control and concrete and other entities. The stuff that these kind of more innovative projects where we're trying to do things we don't normally do are much tougher so you have a kind of a litany of telecommunications, electrical connectivity, custom fabrication, installation and it's difficult to find a general contractor that's willing to do that, particularly sprinkled over many different locations. Um, the mobilization and traffic control for some of these things are very tricky. Um, we actually did, um, after, after we finally parted ways with the RTD concept, we, we did submit a request for information in RFI to see, hey, who would be able to do this? And so we put together the specs of what we thought was appropriate and um, went out to through our procurement process and nobody came back with <laughs> interest so that was a little disheartening um, so so that was some other time that kind of elapsed and then the, um, some of the some of the CDOT requirements are tricky for uh, for us and I think it's good for the board to know anytime you do a capital project with federal money um, there are NEPA requirements, the National Environmental Policy Act requirements so even though we're just talking about putting a video monitor inside a shelter there's still um, you have to do a wetlands determination, for example, <laughs> um, threatened and endangered species. Now, you know, we can do all that. We have um, on-call consultants that can help us through all these kind of, but it's just part of the process. Um, and also, as I mentioned, these are kind of relatively small projects sprinkled in a lot of different places. So from the right-of-way clearances side of things, that's also difficult. Um, we're trying to work through right-of-way right now with CDOT. CDOT, of course, wants to know that do you have the right-of-way to actually do this project, and, and we've shown them kind of our parcel assessment maps that the county has. It's not clear if that's going to be good enough or we have to actually go out and do perform a, a survey with the survey company. That gets challenging, too. So there's a, a litany of kind of things that are more complicated that we thought um, we were going to have to deal with. So um, I, we have been in working with RTD. There's a couple vendors that we're, we're getting more information from, so things are looking more optimistic. Um, so we'd like the opportunity to go ahead and move forward with it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions of the county? Director Jones. Um, I don't have questions. I was just going to pile on a little bit if this is the time to do that. Are you going to hear e on each project separately? or Okay. So this is my opportunity to do a mea culpa to the board. I know that um, we don't take second year delays lightly here. I'm happy that Bob Pfeiffer isn't here because I know he <laughs> really doesn't. Sorry, John's covering for him, so just get ready. Ah, okay. But uh, I, 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 we think we can pull this off with an extension. Um, but I just want to put it in context. This was a, an important but relatively modest project that we thought we could piggy on, piggyback on with RTD. Normally, real-time information uh, ar around transit, you would think, was a part of a bus rapid transit system, right? It would make sense. RTD, as we all know, is short-funded. So we applied for funding so we could add this to um, their system and be a value added and it made perfect sense to do it as a piggyback with their contractor doing the installations as Scott pointed out that didn't happen because they had problems with their contractor and it took a while for that to to come about and then all of a sudden this project got it much more complicated and so as we had to take it on as Scott mentioned he's being polite if you look at the CDOT requirements and again these are existing bus stop shelters. We're just going to cut a hole in the back and put in a TV screen. You have to do a wetlands determination, a section 404 permit determination, a migratory bird survey, um, do a historic Colorado search, develop a stormwater management plan, identify noxious weeds, weeds um, see if there's an air conformity modeling issue, do a noise analysis, um, conduct a site assessment for hazardous waste, uh, the endangered species. So all these things to put in a TV screen. So um, 
well-intentioned. It got a lot more complicated, um, which just has extended the time frame. And so we are guilty of not realizing this, again, modest but important project really in it would be encumbered with all of this bureaucracy. And I don't say that lightly because Boulder County knows how to regulate. We, we, do, we do a lot of regulations in Boulder County, but um, this was bigger than we anticipated in terms of that. Um, and we would like the opportunity to um, finish this and bring it across the finish line because I think, as we know, uh, one of our goals here is to increase transit ridership and leverage our investment in fast tracks and having real-time information for everybody at a bus stop will facilitate ridership. We know that and we'd like the opportunity to help improve the, the uh, system in that way. Director Atchison. Yes, Scott, go back to your earlier comment, the fact you're not getting response from contractors. Is really a 120-day extension going to increase the likelihood you're going to find somebody based upon your description? Well, the, the approach now is to actually split the project apart. Um, what I'd like to do is to have our local funds pay for the all of the electrical work. So we would run electricity to the shelters, each, each of the five shelters that we're looking at. And we would not ask for federal reimbursement for that process, so that's completely outside of that. Um, CDOT has what they call three phases, a design, a construction, and a miscellaneous. And what I'm looking to do now is to purchase the equipment and the IT work inside the miscellaneous. And then the construction phase will be just to install that. And so by splitting it up a little bit, um, I have a little bit more confidence than just having one GC. Are you trying to get back with the original concept of CDOT and RTD's contractors taking that work on? Probably not. I think the... I wish Bill, Bill stepped out, but I think the Bill's right behind you. I think the um, my understanding is that the contract was tough enough that that was not the right vendor. There's a couple of vendors that do this. Um, if you can imagine some of the information displays at like a mall or an airport or something like that, there's a few vendors out there. They just don't do all of it. They do very specific parts. So I think by kind of teasing it out and shouldering a little bit more of with the local funds, we'll be able to make it happen. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chair, with that, I'd recommend the extension of the 120 day, but not again. We have other projects that would be waiting on that dollars if you don't get it done within the next 120 days. Director okay. Brockett. Uh, would a motion be appropriate at this time? Sure. Okay, I'll move that we approve a variance of 120 days to allow the project to continue. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Director Kanich. Thank you. Um, just a systems question, I guess, for the Dr. Cog staff, which is that because we have this partnership with CDOT where they run the contracts, can we have a systemic conversation with them about things that are not actually transportation projects but might be technology projects? Because I think our expectation is we're going to see more of this, and to treat them like a road project or a bike trail just doesn't make sense. So, I mean, regardless of how this turns out, it just seems like we shouldn't be leaving jurisdictions to have that conversation with CDOT alone, that we as a, a regional entity should care about whether the contracting partner we use <laughs> is able to manage this kind of complexity. And I, I, I don't mean to pick on Deb. I don't know. Deb's not here. She's not here. So, but anyway, can we, is, is, that, a, is that an appropriate thing to ask the staff to do? No, definitely so. I think that's certainly appropriate. I don't know if, uh, if Jeff and Danny are here. They want to speak to it. Probably not. But um, but we'll we'll definitely get with CDOT and talk about this some more. I know you know a lot of the things that were mentioned are are really federal requirements, right? So, but but you're right though. And I mean, there's a categorical exclusion. Exactly. So why this didn't go through yeah. that is a total right. mystery to me. Exactly. Other discussion. Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. We move on to the second one, which is Denver. Good evening. My name is Michael Pinocchio with uh, City and County of Denver uh, Public Works. I'm the program manager for TSSIP projects. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come in and give you a little background on this project. Um, I guess in a nutshell, 
in 2016, while we received funds for 2016 to upgrade traffic signals within the downtown area. We also received funds in 2017 to upgrade traffic signals in the downtown area. And we received funds in 2018 to upgrade signals in the downtown area. Um, when we came together as a system management team and working with Dr. Cog and with CDOT, we made the decision that the best way to proceed with these three years worth of funding was to combine them into one project. Um, the reason for that, it'll minimize the impacts to the downtown area, which a lot of you know, uh, we have a lot of construction going on downtown right now. Um, there are over 40 active projects that are closing sidewalks, bike lanes, um, roadway lanes, causing a lot of detours and delay to everyone that we're serving. Um, so with that in mind, we knew that the project timeline would be extremely tight. Uh, we did everything we could to move this project forward. Um, and at the same time, we're moving this forward and looking at it from one IGA standpoint. Um, we also used our internal dollars to start the project early. So we've been looking at uh, traffic signal timing and pulling all the data together for that. We've done all of the right-of-way surveying because we know that once we hit um, the CDOT process, we will have to prove to um, CDOT that everything and everywhere that we're working is within the city and county of Denver right away. And then we've also started the process of getting a design consultant on board. Um, our selection will be next Tuesday for that design consultant. Um, so I am very confident that we will be able to hit a 120 day extension um, if it is extended to us. And, um, and I'm here to answer any other questions that you might have around our approach to this project or what our timelines are. Director Rakowski. Sir, in your undated letter, you said that you should have a signed contract with council approval by mid-October. Do you have it? The contract has been signed by the um, city and county of Denver city council. Okay. It is currently in our attorney's office. We expect it to be delivered to CDOT on Friday. Uh, typically, what we have is about a two-week turnaround from CDOT. Other questions or comments? Director Kanich. Um, thank you, Michael. I just wanted to add really briefly that one of the benefits of combining these projects into one rather than doing them separately um, is that it saved some funding because, and it allowed it to, to stretch the dollars further. So there's an administrative cost, as we all know, to contracting and doing them in three separate contracts would have created some inefficiencies and overhead costs that we're avoiding. The thing that kind of ended up impacting the delay is that you had the, the clock runs from the first reimbursement of dollars, or the first disbursement of dollars, not from the last. And so I think that I just want to, you know, there was a, a good intention here of saving money and not having duplication and overhead and making sure that Dr. Cog's and the federal dollars are really going for the project. And um, so, so there's, a, there's a good outcome here. It just, it just meant, though, that the clock was faster from the, the first dollar disbursement. So if that's helpful for folks. Thanks. Director Shaw. Thank you. I, I'm just curious if there is a provision when you are trying to save funds and it is more cost effective, if there could be proactive notice as opposed to coming right before expiration. If, if we'd known this before, that would be a nice thing for, for all of us for the future, I think. Okay. Other comments or discussion? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Thank you. Yes, we have to clarify what the motion is because there's two options, to deny it or approve 120 days. Motion for approval of the 120 days. The seconder? Yes. Thank you very much. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you very much. And last but not least, North Glen. Good, 
Good evening. I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, my name is Brooks Faboda. I am the planning director for the city of North Glen. And tonight we're here before you to request an extension for our project on 112th. Um, I would like to point out that this is a project associated with the RTD Fast Tracks and also a collaboration with RTD and the city of Thornton. Um, we are very excited about this project and do believe that with the 120 day extension we'll be able to meet that deadline very easily. Um, I'd also like to point out that uh, when we originally requested this first extension, um, we had to modify our scope of work. And part of that was in part because the city had actually built previously what we intended to do with this grant money. Um, in working with uh, Thornton and RTD, we identified a couple things that we would have otherwise not known at the time uh, when we originally made this request to the board. And that is, is that uh, RTD bus service is going to be traveling southbound on York and making a right turn onto 112th. Currently, that intersection can't accommodate that turn movement. And based off of the EIS and our entitlement process, the city could not otherwise have obligated that roadway improvement to RTD at the time. So we'll be able to address that and also provide safe and uh, better bus service and turn movements at that intersection. Secondly, with uh, Thornton, Thornton has a concurrent uh, engineering project that's going to be making roadway improvements from York Street to the east. And part of our project scope overlaps with Thornton's in which we're going to be putting in some signalization and some pedestrian connectivity. All of these things are opportunities that while we, we appreciate um, the consideration for this variance tonight, we otherwise would not be in the position to maximize the value of the partnership as well as the opportunity to uh, create a better connectivity, which was the original intention of our request back in 2012. And with that, I'll open up to any questions. Questions or comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion, a, a clear motion. Motion to deny or approve? Thank you. Second? We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty. Director Cernanek. Just one comment. <clears throat> Um, we we had the nice letters that are there. Um, it's the um, if we if we could. I'm I'm not sure I saw each of the dollar amounts for for them. I saw I saw a couple of them, but not all of them. So I think they're. I thought they were all in the. There's okay. Yeah, there's dollar amounts included within the memo. They're all. They're yeah. They're all there. Got it. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 14, which is attachment G. And we will rely on Mr. Cottrell again. Thank you. So there's six total amendments uh, in this attachment for your consideration this evening. Uh, the first three are related to the uh, 2008 approval of the second commitment in principle to fast tracks. So this last August, the Northwest Corridor Partners uh, submitted a request for the remaining distribution of, um, of their skip funds. Uh, these will go to two new quiet zone projects, one in Broomfield and the other in Westminster. Um, there's additional information in attachment two, which is their, uh, their partnership letter submitted to Dr. Cog. The final three amendments are submitted from RTD, where RTD received a request from FTA um, so that they could obligate partial or full uh, 2017 funding. And in order to do this, they had to move the FY17 funding into the current TIP year for 2018. Um, just uh, it should be noted that RTD is not receiving, receiving any additional funds. Um, this is more of an administrative action to move it into the correct year so FTA could obligate funding for RTD. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments that you may have. Questions or comments? Seeing none, this does require a motion. Move approval. I had a comment. Excuse me, I did not see your hand, Director Peck, sorry. That's okay. Um, I have a comment about the, uh, about the request for funding for signals in Broomfield and Westminster. And uh, my comment basically is that I thought Fast Tracks funding was designated specifically for rail transit. I am wondering why we are giving fast tracks funds for signal connections. We have um, two different groups, MCC and the stakeholders. Um, the stakeholders 
are, are not part of the conversation about the peak service that we're trying to do on that northwest corridor. And uh, the discussion around that peak service where it's just uh, three trains uh, during peak hours back and forth was my understanding that no other amenities from Northwest Corridor funds to existing uh, rail lines were going to be done. We were just going to focus on that backbone. So um, I am going to um, abstain from voting for this until I get information as to why we are putting the fast tracks funding into quiet zones. Can somebody want to explain that to me? M Mr. Controller, Mr. Rex? Well, the only thing I can note is that uh, there's no there's no notion in the policy that says that it, it can't, it, or it has to go towards a rail line itself. It's go to, to implement fast tracks. So as long as what is being constructed now is usable and for future fast tracks implementation, it would be allowable. The only thing, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I still need to make sure that the two entities, one of them that's working on the peak service and uh, the stakeholders who signed this letter are, are uh, connecting or communicating because I'm hearing two different, two different conversations here. And um, if we are going to commit fast tracks Northwest Corridor funds to that peak peak service, without amenities, without any other additions, until that backbone is finished, then I can't vote on this. Mr. X. Um, Director Peck, the only, the only comment I'd make to add to Todd's is um, j just a point of clarification that this, the funding that is associated with these amendments this evening are, are not fast tracks dollars. They're actually Dr. Cog administered dollars in support of the fast tracks program. Okay, I helps. misunderstood that then. It, it read to me like they were fast tracks dollars. And that yeah. could just be my misinterpretation. I'm not. I'm not saying that. Okay. No. No. If it does, I apologize. But it is. It is Dr. Cog administered money. So. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Director Atchison. Yeah. Just as a clarification, the stakeholders that you're referring to, uh, Ms. Peck, include Longmont as part of the U.S. 36 coalition, and we have discussed this assignment of dollars because that's within the corridor's prerogative to assign those dollars. And it was unanimous decision of the U.S. 36 Coalition to approve these dollars. That's why the letter recommending approval is signed in there by uh, Commissioner Elise Jones and myself. Uh, and I think that's the only one from the 36 group that's here tonight. But that is, as uh, Doug indicated, these are strictly Dr. Cog dollars. They're not out of fast track. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Director Jones. And I just would add to that that this um, quiet zone funding um, it, it is an investment that's important to our communities, Longmont included, um, for when the rail arrives and in the time be that we're all waiting for the rail in terms of creating those quiet zones that will be useful um, to address the train horn noise that we're dealing with now and, and hopefully in the future even more so. So it's an investment that will, that will work regardless um, of when the, the rail comes which is why we all unanimously um, signed a letter saying this is how we'd like to make that investment. Further discussion? All right, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you. Agenda item 15 is under attachment H, and that is Mr. Rieger. You guys are just tag teaming back and forth. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me just a moment to pull up my presentation. Okay, thank you again. Uh, so this is an informational item, but we wanted to kick off this conversation about um, some federal requirements that we'll be working on uh, really from now on. I'm tempted to say over the next year, but it's really an ongoing uh, sort of process, and this is the beginning of it. So I wanted to give you uh, an introduction and, and overview tonight. Um, also get your initial input, and then this will come back to you uh, in a few months. 
so the topic here, as it says on the cover slide uh, from our FAST Act, which is our federal uh, transportation uh, legislation, legislation uh, safety performance measures and targets. And as I give this presentation, I do want to recognize a couple of folks. Uh, one on my team, Beth Dolabo, who I hope is sitting somewhere in the back, uh, one of our new transportation planners uh, who's, who's putting a lot of work into this. I also want to recognize Charles Meyer from CDOT, um, who I saw back there. And Charles, I always get your title wrong. You're the State Highway and Safety Traffic Engineer? Let's just call him the safety guru. Um, so we're going we're gonna to tag team on this a little bit. It's mostly my slides, um, but there are a couple slides uh, because this work involves CDOT and coordination between CDOT uh, and Dr. Cog. So you'll hear from Charles uh, in a couple moments. So by way of introduction, you know, every time I present on something like this, the first slide and the first point that I always want to make is that, you know, when we have these new federal requirements, it's not like it's not like we and all of you were never doing anything about these topics. And I just want to drive that point home in this first slide. So we're going to be talking about safety requirements tonight. Um, but on this slide is a list of some of the things that we do here at Dr. Cog um, and things that we do in partnership with you. For example, every approximately three years we do what's called a uh, crash reports. Uh, crash report traffic crashes in the Denver region, which is a very comprehensive look at um, safety trends in this region, um, a deep dive behind the, the numbers of uh, what, kind of, what kind of crashes are occurring, where they're occurring, what are the factors, you know, very good sort of education and awareness uh, type document. We just completed that earlier this year. Um, crash data analysis and visualization on our driver uh, site, on our Dr. Cog website, our Denver visual Denver Regional Visual Resources. Uh, we have some pretty cool visualizations of some of this crash data. Um, in addition to looking overall sort of crash data within the region, um, every few years we look at bicycle pedestrian uh, safety analysis. In the past we've published kind of standalone reports on that topic. Uh, this time uh, we're actually kicking off our regional bicycle pedestrian, what we're calling our active transportation plan. And as part of that plan we'll be doing a comprehensive bicycle uh, pedestrian safety analysis. And then finally, in our brand new, what we call our Unified Planning Work Program, which is our transportation planning work program, we have an initiative that we'll be kicking off later this year over the next year um, that's called a Towards Vision Zero or Regional, uh, Regional Vision Zero initiative, which is uh, piggybacking on some work that Denver and Boulder and I think a couple other view local governments are starting to do of looking at this concept of how can we really reduce and eventually eliminate uh, traffic crashes and we're going to try and scale that up to the regional level. So, and, and we could go on much more about this. The point is that we are all together uh, doing a lot of things around safety. Um, be that as it may, we do have specific federal requirements. Um, this is a slide uh, from uh, Federal Highway Administration. Basically here, I'm not going to go through all this step by step. Um, I'll make a couple points here. This is part of a larger uh, sort of concept in the rulemaking um, that's now statute um, that's about transportation performance measurement. Um, and as you see here, you know, you sort of start at the top. Um, you have targets and, and measures. We well, have national goals um, that, that work their way down into measures and targets, you know, the plans that you do, you know, so on and so forth. So it's part of a, it, it's part of a overall sort of framework of, of transportation performance uh, measurement, transportation performance planning um, that FHWA and USDOT uh, is starting to require of both uh, CDOT, State DOT, and us, Dr. Cog, as the MPO. So every MPO and every State DOT is doing some version of this. So this rulemaking under the FAST Act um, covers multiple topics. Um, you can see that there's a lot of things on the screen that are purposely sort of grayed out. And the point I would make here is that all those other topics are things that you will hear from us um, over the next you know, months and years. Um, but we're going to start tonight with safety. And then over time, as these rules get put into place and as we have our, our deadlines and requirements, we'll come back to you and talk about some of these other things. But just very briefly, uh, the transportation performance measurement rules um, under the FAST Act, in addition to safety, cover things like pavement and bridge condition, uh, what they call travel time reliability, uh, freight reliability, um, and congestion, which has a couple things in it. So multiple set of requirements. We're going to start with safety tonight. So specifically on safety of what's required under the federal rulemaking um, in the area of safety, there are five specific things that we need to measure and that CDOT needs to measure. Uh, those are listed here. Uh, the, number of, the number of total fatalities, annual fatalities, total fatalities, uh, fatalities per, per, per million vehicle miles traveled, 
uh, number of serious injuries, and there's a definition for that, uh, serious injuries also per million vehicle miles traveled, and then the combined number of non-motorized fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries. So those five things, and this is a national requirement, again, every MPO, every state, DOT is having to do these five things. We need to set targets and measure our performance against the targets that we set for each of these five performance measures under safety. So let's talk about that just from a process standpoint. As I said, this applies to both CDOT um, and to us, uh, Dr. Cog is the MPO. Um, CDOT actually had to go first. They had, a, um, they had a deadline of August of this year, and they have set their 2018 targets, and you'll hear from Charles in just a moment on those targets. Um, we have a deadline that's 180 days after uh, after CDOT set their targets. So um, Doug has stamped this date on my forehead. By February 27th of 2018, we have to bring to you and adopt uh, these safety targets. Now this is an annual process, so the point I would make here is that we're setting, you know, the first time we do this, we're setting targets for 2018. That's going to cover what the feds um, require of us, which is a five-year average of data from 2014 through 2018. And this is an annual process, so we're starting for 2018 now. We're going to come to you next year, and we're going to do this for 2019. And when we set targets for 2019, we're going to look at the period of 2015 to 2019. So it's a, what we call a rolling five-year average. We'll be starting to do this every year. Um, Dr. Cog will report um, our targets and our performance to CDOT. CDOT, in turn, will report to the Federal Highway Administration. So, for example, um, in the year 2019, we will report results for the 2018 targets that we'll be setting by February 27th. And then, and that happens in 2019. In 2020, um, FHWA does their assessment of, you know, how did we collectively perform against our targets? Did we meet our targets? Did we show what they call adequate progress? Um, trust me, you don't want me to get into how they measure that right now, um, but they will be looking at that for both CDOT um, and for us as the MPO. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Charles um, for the next couple of slides so that Charles can talk about both the targets that CDOT has set and then we have a snapshot of one of those measures. Remember that there's five, so we picked fatalities and Charles will walk through how CDOT set uh, targets for fatalities as the methodology is relatively similar for each of the five targets. So Charles? Okay, I'll go ahead. Let's well, I, I, the one question I was going to ask is somewhere between the two of you to cover um, data collection and that not being duplicated. Um, I know it gets reported up, but um, how do the definitions work and how to make sure there's consistency across that? So just if you can address that as you go through it, Charles, that would be wonderful. You bet. So uh, let me start with that. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, I, you know, Jacob, I just want to, you know, thank you for the invitation, uh, bringing here, me here, as well as the collaboration. Data is, is one of the areas that we are collaborating on. Uh, so CDOT receives the, uh, the crash data statewide from the Department of Revenue. And uh, then we work with various entities, and, and sometimes it's local agencies specifically, uh, sometimes it's MPOs, uh, and Dr. Cog is one of those that we work directly with uh, to correspond our, our data and, uh, and share it back and forth. Uh, in fact, in the Dr. Cog area, uh, you provide some value added to it and then and return that back to us by adding location information to it. Uh, that we can't or, or sometimes don't necessarily get from uh, uh, DOR. Uh, so I, I think it's a good relationship. There's, we can always do better in improving data and data quality, um, and uh, so continued opportunities to do that. Hopefully that uh, addressed your question. Okay. Okay. Oh. Well, if I may, Director Stanek, let me just give you actually even more specificity that might help answer the question a little bit more. Everything Charles said is correct, and I'll just add another layer of clarity to that. Uh, one of my staff, one of, one, one of his uh, big pieces of his job is actually to take the crash data from CDOT. So CDOT geocodes, which means locationally codes, um, crash information on their system on state highways. For off-system within the Dr. Cog region, uh, my staff actually takes all that data and geolocates it or geocodes it, and it's about, I think it's something like 50 or 60,000 records, Charles, on off-system. And we spend a lot of time, you know, putting that information together so that we have good information about where those crashes are occurring. And then we work together with CDOT to put that back together so that we have a comprehensive set of crash data for the entire region. 
and other MPOs, frankly, are not as fortunate to have uh, that level of data. But who, who gets that original crash data? So um, accident happens at um, not at a state highway, Jackass Hill and Mineral Avenue. Um, how does that get to Jacob and his staff, and how does it get to you so that it actually gets rolled up? So once a crash happens, a law enforcement officer responds to that. They fill in a, a state uh, Department of Re Revenue crash form. Uh, they fill that in, and then they submit that to Department of Revenue. Uh, some entities submit it electronically. Others submit it by paper. Uh, Department of Revenue then provides that data through a, a new download to CDOT. And then we provide that data to various, uh, various entities, Dr. Cog being one of them. Department of Revenue just sounds strange, though. I've gotten that, uh, that reaction many times here in the last uh, several months. Uh, and, and I think it's worth uh, more discussion. Uh, we have been in discussion with Department of Revenue on roles and responsibilities and, and uses of data. And, you know, and really, what is, is each of our paradigms when it comes to data? How do we use it? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think we all in this room, uh, you know, being transportation professionals, are interested in improving the safety of transportation using that data, you know, protecting the, the traveling public. And uh, uh, it's very critical that we have the, the best data. And so I, you know, I think we are really the, the closest stewards to that, uh, yet that's not how, how our legislation is set up uh, to take care of that data. So I, I, I think it is worth further discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Director Brockett. So if I, if I may follow up on that over here. Yes. <laughs> it's always hard to tell who's talking. <laughs> right. Um, so in terms of you know, protecting the traveling public, so the, the data is coming to you then in, and it's geocoded. You can tell where there are clusters of accidents and such. How are you making use of that to then make safety improvements based on where the problems are? Okay. Uh, so, so some of the data is geocoded, uh, uh, you know, especially the, that on major systems, especially state highways, interstates, uh, U.S. highways, because there's a linear referencing system, uh, highway and mile point. Uh, on the local system, there may not be that, that data in the crash form. Sometimes an officer will give us a GPS, oftentimes they, they won't. Uh, because they don't have that technology. And, and that kind of speaks to uh, uh, how do we work with law enforcement to, to help them get that technology. I think we all have that, that uh, keen interest in that, whereas Department of Revenue may not as, as much. Um, uh, but uh, if it doesn't have that geolocated information, we can work with local agencies to, to do that. We have a number of crash coders ourselves at CDOT, uh, a limited number, and they go through each of the crash records uh, to do that as well as uh, refine the data. Uh, and then to your question of how does it get used, uh, uh, gets used extensively, analyzed extensively, both by us as well as local agencies and uh, the MPOs. Uh, as Jacob mentioned, there's a lot of visualization and analysis of that data to determine where are there specific patterns that are occurring over time that, that really do need specific attention? Or, or where is there a change? And, and what are those patterns? Uh, and I, I would be glad to come back uh, another night and, and, and show you how we do some of that analysis. Uh, and to help us make you know, prioritized, uh, you know, good, effective, efficient uh, decisions on how we, we all use our, our taxpayer dollars entrusted to us. Glad to do that. Thank you. Director Atchison. One of the things that, that we're doing up on what I'll call the North End uh, under NADA, and especially with the city of Thornton, we're using a lot of that data to analyze what's happening on I-25. And what are we doing about mitigation, if we can, of anything? Uh, Eric can jump in where he feels comfortable to try to see if there's something from a local level of us on along in North I-25 corridor with our local enforcement can do to assist CDOT either in incident management or other controls that we can use to try to figure out how to reduce the traffic fatality or the time it takes to clear an accident. 
those are some of the things that we're trying to integrate with the native group and, and our local groups up there along with CDOT because of the time. When it takes four and five hours to clear a small accident, it's tying up stuff for many more hours than that because of the interruption of traffic, and, and then we get more traffic, and then we get more accidents because of, the, lack of a better word, looky-loos. Uh, everybody wants to see what the shiny red and white lights are, and then they aren't paying attention. Then we get another accident up on top of it. So that clearing time is very critical to how soon we can get somebody in, get them off the roadway, open that traffic back up, and very much in line with what you're talking about. That's data that we all use. So I'll just point out real quick uh, before I call on Director Rakowski that um, part of that conversation is is uh, was part of the presentation by uh, Robert Spots yesterday that the, the full board will see here in the next meeting or two. Director Rakowski. Uh, if it's okay to ask this question now, last year we had 672 traffic fatalities? 608. Uh, 608. And where are we year to date? We just broke the 500 mark. I think we're at 505 as of today. And where were, where were we last year at 505? What, what date did we hit 505 last year? Uh, much earlier. Uh, so thankfully this year we're about 5% less than we were where we were last year. Thank time. you. Okay, so so uh, uh, I know safety is always, uh, and, and as it should be, a serious and, and interesting topic to all of us. Uh, so. Uh, Jacob asked me just to come and give you a little bit of background on how we arrived at the, the safety targets that we've set uh, for the state. Um, so they're, they're shown up here, and let me provide just a little bit of clarification to them because there, there's a lot uh, going be, uh, on behind the numbers themselves. Uh, so looking at fatalities, uh, that 610 uh, it, it is a target, uh, and as Jacob mentioned, it's a five-year target uh, that is set for 2014 to 2018. Uh, you know, as was mentioned last year, uh, we are at uh, uh, there were 608 fatalities. So, you know, one might look at that and think, okay, we're we're just planning on being you know steady. Uh, however, being that this is a a five-year target. Uh, this actually accounts for expected increases in fatalities in the next two years. Uh, so CDOT and the next couple of slides show this, some of the statistical analysis, which I won't get too much into the detail with. But uh, when we did look at that statistical analysis, we looked at the past years and, and the, the increasing trend that we're seeing. Uh, at the time that we set these, we were again seeing that increasing trend in 2017. Thankfully, that is, has slowed a bit uh, this year. Uh, but what it led us to, to uh, set as a target was the 610, which accounts for uh, or, or expects around uh, 700 fatalities here in calendar year 2017, and then almost 800 fatalities in 2018. Uh, which are quite alarming numbers. Uh, we, and uh, philosophically, you will likely go through this discussion that we did where uh, we at CDOT thought uh, we were being asked to set targets. And normally one would think a, a target is a goal, is something that we're trying to strive for. Uh, in our discussion and looking at the trends and uh, doing that statistical analysis, which was really the easy part, the, the harder part was then thinking what is changing in our environment? Uh, is there anything changing to the positive in our environment that would potentially bring these numbers down and, and lead us to setting lower targets? And for the most part, uh, uh, there weren't a lot of things in that direction. And that's why CDOT took a more, uh, say, pessimistic, uh, what we think is a realistic approach, especially this first year as we're getting to know the, the system and the process. And so um, just for reference, uh, the 610 uh, accounts for about a 10% increase uh, per year uh, for 2017 and 18. Uh, so as you start considering should we 
adopt and support CDOT's targets as set, or should we uh, go with our own MPO-specific targets? Um, that's a, a reference maybe to use in consideration. Uh, the, the other targets that are up there somewhat reflect kind of the same process, the same thinking, uh, the same analysis. So uh, really not too much to add with, with these next couple of slides. Uh, with this one, we just looked at uh, where were we for specific uh, fatalities each year, the actual number of fatalities, and what was the trend line for, for 2017 and 18. This, was, this shows two different statistical analyses. Uh, there were a couple of others that we used. Uh, and then that led to the next slide, which uh, uh, helped us set that five-year moving average target that, that FHWA requires. So, so the, this was the statistical analysis that FHWA is using uh, or requiring as a part of their methodology and process. Uh, so we used that, but then again, considered those other factors uh, in order to land on the, the final targets. So with that, uh, any other questions? Director Teeter. Yes, I would like to. Is it possible to get the information on uh, the number of fatalities at a particular intersection? I have two intersections that I would like to see how they stack up on your report and see where we stand at. Definitely. You bet. I have a, a card here. I'll, I'll get that to you so you can contact us. Director Christman. So I have a better understanding of what uh, Dr. Cog's responsibility will be with regard to non-CDOT um, highways. Is it safe to say that a safety target is a misnomer, that it's really a fatality and serious injury prediction? It has, we're not really talking safety. We're just taking numbers, averaging them, and predicting how many people will die or be injured based on past facts. Is that correct? Is that what we're expected to do? Yes, it is, it is a target of, of what will happen in the very near term future. Right. Okay. I mean, Thank you. To be blunt, yes. Yeah. Okay. So you'll, you'll hear Charles and I call it safety targets because that's sort of the, the federal language of in this category because, again, remember, we're going to come back to you in several of these categories, but this is under the framework of in the federal language of safeties and setting safety targets. I have, I have Director Cernanek and then Director Graves and Brockett. Uh, this was a uh, Roger Partridge question. So uh, <laughs> with, with the prediction out there for the fatalities, do we know where they're going to be so that we can avoid those places? I do have a couple more slides when we're done with this round of questions, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit. Director Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Point of clarification, it, we are setting this target, but really as board members with the expectation that we are doing what we can in our communities to reduce or stay this number. So I don't, I don't think it's as grim as, as perhaps what Director Christman has <laughs> outlined here. But I just want to be clear on that because this is a serious issue and we do have a lot of power within our jurisdictions and here at this body to raise public awareness, make investments and policy changes to impact this number. Uh, second thing while I, I have the mic here, this presentation and the visit by the State Patrol at the last meeting, was the last meeting, has really got me thinking about the service of the State Patrol. And it might be very nice for this body to send some formal letter acknowledging their service and sacrifice on Colorado's roadways in the spirit of this initiative, because I don't really feel that they get enough recognition for the risk and also the psychological trauma of dealing with this many fatalities across Colorado. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. I have Director Brockett, then Director Teal. Yeah, I certainly support that idea, but I'll, I'll hold my comments until the end of your presentation. Director Teal. Um, uh, so a question for the Executive Director. Um, given, uh, given where this data is coming together and when we are uh, when we are able to make a formal report to uh, the feds on this, I mean, do we have a degree of confidence that this is um, – uh, data that we can use for geographic targeting or at least geographic 
you know, a feeling for where, uh, as Anthony just said, wh where the worst kind of places are, okay, so that we can, as Director Graves said, make use of it as a part of a TIP criteria. Are we far enough along in our TIP uh, criteria creation that this is too late? Or do we feel like the data will be available at a time that it could possibly be integrated as an additional factor when we're taking a look at our TIP? Because otherwise, um, I, I think the data, the, the analysis is great, um, uh, but if we don't do anything with it, who cares? Permanent Executive Director Rex. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, we most definitely. <laughs> wow, that's and, and thank goodness for that. <laughs> yeah, right. No, sir, we we definitely do. We you know we. The only thing I will say is that the the data always runs a year or so behind. Actually, you know, by the time it gets all aggregated and everything, but it, we 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 can clearly see trends and where where the um, you know the more accident prone locations are those types of things by by on every roadway within our region so we can do we can you know we can query that off however you would like but yes we we will be using um, such criteria within our within our uh, well for our next tip call yeah because I mean that would match the uh, the policies in Castle Rock uh, I know for the last decade we've been trying to do a lot of our internal uh, um, capital improvements uh, really targeting what are our unsafe uh, intersections, what are the stretches of roadway that we are seeing, you know, that, that are well known by our fire department as being, you know, unsafe. So, I mean, I, it, it would be in fitting with uh, what we're doing in Castle Rock, so I would definitely recommend that course of action. No, that's excellent. If I may, real quick, Mr. Chairman, um, if, there's, if there is a community that would like to know what the top ten, you know, highest frequency crash locations are within their community or whatever, we, we, we can query that off for you. So just get with, with Jacob or, or, my, or, or myself, we'll do that. Okay, I have Director Dick and then Director Partridge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tomorrow I may find out that I'm incorrect, but I believe anybody in the North End, since we're a collaborative area, if they need GPS, I believe every officer has one on his body now from Federal Heights only in Federal Heights. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Director Partridge. Uh, Director Graves brought up the State Patrol's presentation by uh, Chief Mark Savage last meeting. And if I recall, we were, we were asking for the date and maybe bring it forward to all of us jurisdictions. There was a safety responder day, a mayor resolution, and I wonder, has, uh, I can't remember exactly what the follow-up is going to be. Maybe it was to our particular chiefs and sheriffs. But I wonder if we might check on that. Because I think that was coming up in November and sometime. And I really think we need to recognize that for the State Patrol. I wonder if that is something we can't follow up with, Dr. Cog. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah, I think that's a tremendous idea. And you're right. I, believe, I think you're right that it is in November. Um, and there was the opportunity for, to, to do a resolution. I know there was talk about, you know, around your horseshoes, the possibility of doing that. Um, if you would give us the discretion to, to get that resolution and actually do one on behalf of this board, we'd be happy to do that, as well as forward that to all of our member local governments. Right, and certainly time's a factor, no doubt, because it usually has to, uh, takes a little bit of time to create those resolutions for the jurisdictions and even for Dr. Cog. I don't know if we would have that opportunity to, to make that if yeah. we had, would choose to beforehand, but no doubt. No, well, we'll look into it at least. Thank you, sir. Yep. Mr. Eager. Thank you very much. Um, I think I just have one more slide, so um, and I'll try and answer a couple of the questions that were asked. So let me clarify a couple of things on this sort of exercise of target setting. One is that we have the requirement as the MPO to set safety targets for our entire MPO area. So for all, you know, this is a sort of total and cumulative analysis. It does, it's not just CDOT roads or just, you know, Denver roads or just certain kinds of roads. It's for the entire region. Um, these are sort of total annual numbers. So I wanted to clarify that. Um, the other thing I want to say um, in terms of federal guidance is that um, they have frankly said not to be aspirational. And what they mean by that is that, again, remember I said this is a rolling five-year average. Um, so it's, it's a very sort of near-term, very specific time frame. You know, we can all agree that one death is, is, is one too many. Um, but again, you're being judged on these sort of rolling five-year averages. And so you need to set something that, that's sort of realistic and in scale with um, the band of data that you're looking at. And so that is something that we need to keep in mind. Um, so as it says on this slide, let me say a couple things about uh, the concept of setting targets. 
Um, so we have this requirement, you know, to set targets in these five areas, and we have a couple paths that we can choose in terms of the overall um, sort of direction that we want to go. And Charles alluded to this. One is that we could support CDOT targets. Um, and we've gotten a little bit of different guidance from the feds over the months on this, but we could either directly support the targets that Charles showed you, and we could say, you know, we are signing up to support those targets, and through the Dr. Cog region, our efforts are, are contributing towards meeting those targets, or we could set sort of proportional targets for our region that, that mathematically proportionally uh, relate to CDOT targets. So that's kind of one, one thing we can do. Um, I will be frank with you. I mean, again, this is an informational item, but I am going to, um, I am going to use my discretion to make a couple of recommendations um, and, and hopefully uh, not get in trouble for that. One recommendation is that I do think, frankly, that we may want to set our own course. I think we want to control our own destiny on this, and that is not uh, any sort of criticism of CDOT or any reflection on CDOT. We are coordinating very closely. Uh, we're meeting at least monthly on this topic now. Um, but I think that maybe we want to um, uh, we want to be able within our Dr. Cog region. You know, we are unique. We are specific. That we want to be able to control our own destiny. So that is a that is a sort of uh, tentative recommendation I'm going to make to you. In terms of calculating targets, and again, Charles alluded to this, there are several sort of mathematical approaches, you know, regression analysis, uh, mathematical manipulation that we could use to do that. Um, but there's also the policy approach as well. I mean, we do have some discretion on the path that we take. What the feds are looking for is, you know, not so much 2 plus 2 equals 4. What they're looking for is what process did we use? Who did we coordinate with? How did we go about our decision making? Who did we involve? Um, those sorts of things. So w the onus is on us as staff and as Dr. Cog to, you know, use a reasonable and, and de defensible approach to do this. But within that, we do have some latitude and discretion about specifically how we do it. So one thing I'm going to put out here, this is sort of a sneaky, you know, I'm going to put it out there so it becomes your idea, but it's really my idea, um, and see how you react to this. <laughs> uh, we, we definitely we definitely don't want to guide you too much. I mean, we do honest, you know, want your honest input. But one thing that we're intrigued by, one idea um, that we've started looking at is that if you go back and look at our MetroVision plan, we do one of the, one of the key performance targets in there uh, in MetroVision is, you know, addressing safety. And as it says on the screen here, um, in MetroVision we have the safety target of less than 100 fatalities by 2040. Now, again, that both gets at the difference of what I said. That is an aspirational long-range target, right? Uh, whereas the Fed say, you know, rolling five-year average, where particularly for 2018, two of those years are already set. You know, we're looking, or actually three of the years are already set. 14, 15, 16, there's nothing we can do about for the 2018 target. 2017, we're almost done with. There's almost nothing we can do about. So we really have one year, right, to, to do something that might influence the first set of targets we set. So I do want to be clear that we are talking about two different things. But having given those caveats, the sort of idea that the seed I want to plant with you is that uh, what we could do is we could um, look at that sort of 2040 target of less than 100 fatalities for MetroVision. We could translate that to what would that look like if we did that on sort of an annual basis? What would it take year by year to work our way to 2040 to meet that target and use that kind of information uh, to set our, our near-term 2018 target? So that's an idea that, that we're sort of intrigued by, wanted to float that out there. But really what we want is just your sort of initial uh, reaction and guidance because we'll be working on this um, over the I mean, we're starting to work on it already, but we'll be working working on this over the next few months to bring back to you um, in the winter some draft targets to meet our February 27th deadline. Um, and with that, I'll say thanks very much and be happy to answer any additional questions. Director Brockett. Yeah, thank you very much for that, that presentation. And uh, th that suggestion sounds like a good one. Um, but the, the, having those goals, uh, you can bring it back to the current day, but having those goals is meaningless unless we're implementing measures to achieve those goals. And the goodness, the statistics we we're just seeing are really alarming. It's a 25% increase in fatalities over the last, or from 2014 to 2016. It's terrible. Um, so I'm glad. I think uh, one of our tip focus areas. Um, I forget the exact language, but is a focus on safety. Doug, what's our exact? Yeah, it, is, um, it is a focus on safety and security. Great. Yeah. So I'd, I'd love to, to see us really implement that in terms of the projects that we're funding in the next tip cycle. Um, to see if we can make some progress on kind of these horrible numbers. And then just one little little thing on language. I'm, I'm really glad to see that Dr. Cog is looking at doing a regional Vision Zero initiative where we could maybe provide some leadership, get some best practices from cities and counties that are working on these things, and then provide examples as well. Um, and just a, a little plug on language. I, Boulder's current program is called Towards Vision Zero. 
and I keep trying to get us to change it because vision zero is already aspirational. We don't have to go towards having a vision of zero. <laughs> we, we can just have a vision of zero. And even though that's really hard to achieve, um, we, you can at least uh, have a vision of zero and not go towards having a vision of zero. So, so in the queue, I have Stolzman, Rakowski, and Atchison. Director Stolzman. Thank you very much. So one thing I've been thinking about is we could look at our 2040 Metro Vision target and scale it to an annual basis for our 2018 target. <laughs> just kidding, that wasn't my idea. But I did want to point everyone um, j just to something Jacob said earlier in the presentation was that there is that really great Denver resource visual visualization um, tool, the driver tool, and everybody should go in there and look at their community. You can zoom into your community and it shows all the intersections and you can scale it. So it's a really nice map and a tool that you don't even have to ask someone um, for the information. It's already there for us. And there's a link to that in our packet. Director Rakowski. Having worked in this area for longer than I'd care to admit, there are two things that you can do right now that will cut down fatalities. One, step up your intoxication issues of DUI, and number two, seat belts. If you look at people that die, it often comes, they're ejected. And those are the two big things that you can do right now that would have an impact on these numbers. Director Atchison. Yeah, I want to direct this to uh, actually to Anthony and Robin. The program that Denver's got, Vision Zero, is I'm, if I got it right, I see it on the marquee every time I come down Broadway and half the time I'm trying to, yeah, toward Vision Zero, <laughs> whatever it is. Toward almost. Yeah. <laughs> when will you have some kind of data feedback on how, how the program is either doing something or doing nothing? And is that an opportunity for us to take something like that as a model and try to see if we can incorporate that into, into something larger? Director Graves. Thank you. Well, we are already actively tracking all data across the city and county of Denver, and then we're thinking critically about the investments that we're going to be in to roll out. Some of those investments will be made through the bond that will pass this November. <laughs> a through G. Right, absolutely. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for doing that, we sir. We them all. And so it's it's a, a ball that we're tracking very closely. Okay. Director Cernanek. Uh Yes, and I'm going to pile on to uh, what Director Rakowski mentioned, uh, but add to it. Uh, there's been an alarming rate of traffic fatalities nationally, and the hypothesis at this point in time in, in dealing with that analysis is all of the smart equipment that is inside the machines uh, that we call cars now. Um, of course, I have a smart machine on my bike as well. Um, and that that distraction and uh, whatever we can be doing to reduce distracted driving. And I know that uh, at least uh, some of the releases on uh, smartphones and the latest updates allow for turning the, your machines off when you're driving and encouraging folks to actually use that so they're not fumbling around trying to pick up a text uh, because the additional element of the hypothesis is um, many folks are not using their smartphones necessarily to communicate by voice uh, they're using it to communicate by text which is a lot more um, time and uh, digital intensive uh, while folks are trying to control whatever vehicle that they have and uh, that might be a, a future subject for uh, some conversation uh, as to what can be done, uh, not necessarily among ourselves right now, but um, taking a look at what, what some of those hypotheses are and what we might be able to do about it. Other questions or comments? Director Crispin. Um, going to the target. Can you, can you pull the mic closer, oh, please? Thank you. Going to the target numbers. Um, for purposes of reporting and meeting federal guidelines, I, I would suggest that we follow uh, the process that CDOT is doing and whether we use uh, regression analysis or, but to create uh, a truly predictive based on our best guess, then that sets hopefully our ceiling. That's what we've reported. If we hit that or below, we look good. We can set for ourselves a much lower one without impacting our federal requirements and reporting. That's all I was going to say. 
Anything else? Seeing no one, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, both of you, very informational and um, obviously elicited a lot of response and conversation. We will be back. Thank you. Okay, on to agenda item 16, committee reports. Uh, the stack, Director Jones. With thanks to staff for helping summarize this, it'll be brief. Um, stack in September covered three major issues. Uh, we discussed the potential projects and overall strategy for submitting applications for the federal Tiger and Infra grant programs. We also received an update on CDOT's policy directive number 14, which addresses CDOT's multimodal transportation performance measures and objectives, and also guides uh, CDOT's resource distribution for its statewide plan, STIP, and the budget. And then we also got an update on Central 70. Thank you. Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. A couple of things. We went down to the monkey house and tooled around with the lions and the armadillo and the snakes and stuff. Felt like we were at the legislative breakfast. <laughs> but uh, a big part of it is, as we've continued to talk about transportation, uh, we did meet with the group that uh, from Metro Chamber that will be spearheading the transportation project coming out for uh, petitioning and being on the 18 ballot. Uh, the discussion continues to be, what is that ask of the voters going to be? It is jumping between the point six five that we talked about with uh, the bill that we had in the legislature, 1242, sorry, I'm trying to remember the number, to what 267 tried to allude to, then failed. And now it's anywhere between that point six five and a penny. So it's not firm. It's not determined. Uh, we're continuing to have meetings uh, with those groups. Uh, Impact 64, Sierra Club, the whole bunch is still working together as a statewide coalition, and we want to hold that coalition together so that when it comes time that we do have a combined front that either we're going to try to take on transportation as a statewide initiative or we're going to just say we can't go anywhere and we're going to leave the roads and potholes to every municipality and the state's going to shut down their highways. I'm going to bite my tongue. Uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We did meet. We do meet now six times a year. So we had a meeting here a couple weeks ago and had a presentation from the Colorado Business Community for the Arts. And so it probably makes more sense if we talk about SCFD, the Scientific Cultural Facilities Districts. We're all familiar with that. But they gave not only a presentation on what is the uh, eye and the beholder talking about art itself, whether you have red eyes or green eyes even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just let you know the print was in red. So, <laughs> But to give you an idea, the, just the fiscal impact from $176 million roughly is, is the donations that occurs. And the economic impact is almost three times that. So if you're familiar with job multipliers, it's really pretty impressive. It's up there with engineers. So it was $512 million fiscal impact, economic impact to the area. So very impressive to see what the arts actually do for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Advisory Committee on Aging, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Uh, and I'm handing the report off to Jayla because she had, because there's not good news. And that's why I called on her. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to the board for nominating Mr. Rex. We as staff, I know I speak for all the staff, um, we strongly support him. And I was getting ready to say, hey, it's a package deal. If you don't take him, I'm out. Because um, <laughs> he's awesome. So thank you so much. Um, uh, had a really good time uh, in Commerce City this week. Uh, Commerce City has established a senior commission to their council, which is awesome. Uh, and we had a really good discussion. I also went to Thornton on the request of Mary Williams to talk to their faith-based community. So that was really fun, too. So it's really fun to see you guys um, you know, embracing this and understanding um, the impacts of an aging population and, and really thinking about it. Uh, this has been an interesting week, <laughs> uh, to say the least. A few days ago, we got a notice from the state saying, we have not gotten our federal dollars, and therefore you will not get your federal dollars. And 
I said, okay, what does that mean? And I went and talked to our financial people. I'm like, where are we with our spending? Because we've been using only state dollars, right? And it's not just staff. It's all of those meals on wheels. It's transportation. It's legal services. All those 30 contractors, right? And all of the people that are employed with those dollars. Um, I started to do... I've been working at Dr. Cog a very long time. This is the third time this is happening, and I've learned from those previous times that you have to take action fast. Um, so uh, I started calling people and getting some information, and there was a whole lot of, well, there's nothing we can do. It's the federal government, and there's nothing we can do. And I just didn't want to buy that. Um, so I... Talked to Rich, and I talked with Doug, and we started strategizing. Um, and we figured out the drop dead date for services, which is about mid December. That's when we would have to tell our contractors stop providing services because we don't have any money to pay you. That's very, very scary, right? Um, that put pressure on the state, and the state started trying to come up with ideas. Um, Rich said in that meeting with me as well, Mickey, our federal lobbyist, was on a cruise. He took his parents. Isn't that awesome? Um, but as soon as he got off that cruise, I, we were talking, and he, we were strategizing about a federal plan because we knew there were we identified three advocacy points um, and then started strategizing on how we were going to do that Mickey started making calls I made calls to the National Association we had a statewide meeting over the phone with the AAA directors on how we were going to try and handle this the state started looking for ways they could have, find some more money. Uh, the good news is, this afternoon, Doug doesn't even know this, um, we got notified yesterday that calls had been made and there was a congressional inquiry and likely OMB, the office of OMB, who hadn't re released the grant notifications to the Administration on Community Living Therefore, the state would then not release money to us. So it's all bureaucratic. It had already been passed. It had already been approved, right? It's just people didn't sign the paperwork. Um, because of that effort, and, and I'm sure some other people's efforts, um, we just got notified late this evening that our federal funds have been awarded. And we got the notification. <laughs> Yay. Here's the bad news. <laughs> we have funding for a whole two months. <laughs> December 8th, we start all over again because we're in a continuing resolution. So Congress has to take action in order for us to get our federal dollars. We've already spent all of our state dollars. We are going to be doing this as long as we're living in the continuing resolution world. I want to tell you that the team at Dr. Cog here, uh, at our division directors, um, Steve from, from communications and, and media was like, we got to get on this. And Doug was like, we got to get on this. And there was this all coming together saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. And that is something I have never experienced before um, at Dr. Cog. So uh, we have a very dedicated executive team here that are willing to help everybody out so um, we still have some work to do it was kind of a little test huh Doug and now <laughs> we kind of know what we need to continue to do um, we're trying to build in some security so that come February so we have a little bit of money um, we won't be in the same position again talking about cutting services because you all don't want to hear about Meals on Wheels being cut, and transportation trips being cut. And those are the two pots of money that were most at risk, and the ombudsman, the long-term care ombudsman. Exciting times.
Never a dull moment in the AAA, ever. Thank you very much. Just wanted to make you aware. All right. Uh, the RAC did not meet, so we're on to F, which is uh, E-470, Director Partridge. Mm. Oh, Director Rakowski. I thought you weren't there this time. Uh, and I was, but I have a spokesman who was, and that's Wynn Shaw. Director yeah. Shaw. <laughs> Director Partridge. <laughs> and Baker. And Baker. And Director Baker. <laughs> or Dyack. I, I was in attendance. I'll be happy to give the as <laughs> as we all are aware, as budget. So E470 meeting was the annual budget presentation, and since we have eight voting members here and Dr. Cog that are members of E470 and many other supporting members are contributing to it with Greenwood Village, Lone Tree, even uh, C dot RTD, uh, you know, very important. But just give you an idea, you, we all know, uh, understand budgets to a degree, but give you an idea that E-470 is the only tolling agency in the state, which is unusual pretty much for uh, state to state. But just let you give you an idea of what is involved in E-470 is just a little bit of rundown, six, seven departments. Obviously, you have an operating and capital budget, but you have a finance department too, but there's toll operations, information technology department, engineering roadway maintenance and tolling services so it, there's a lot that goes into tolling that makes it very complicated and I just want to say really uh, Phil it's a uh, great pleasure to sit on that great honor and it's really neat that we have so many members of this group that sit on that so and then uh, also they are doing a toll rate and revenue study the results are not out but uh, hold on to your hats we're looking forward to see what the results will come of that in the next few months very good Mr. Van Meter. The board met in, the RTD Board of Directors met in committee last night and uh, recommended approval to the full board a couple of items of potential interest here. One is they recommended adoption of the six year strategic budget plan and the six-year annual program evaluation, strategic budget plan for the base system at RTD and the annual program evaluation for fast tracks. Our CFO, Heather McKillop, addressed this group last month telling you where we were at. I now have the privilege of telling you where we are at. Yeah, okay, whatever. Um, yeah. Um, the, so generally um, some good news to report. Heather reported some real struggles regarding balancing both of those plans. She also reported um, that it looked like RTD would need to use base system dollars to support our current commitments on fast tracks, capital and operating over the six year period the plan that was presented last night does not make that requirement. Over that six year period, Fast Tracks can stand on its own feet without funds being transferred from the base system. It does draw down Fast Tracks internal savings account dollars to support Fast Tracks, but it does not require base system dollars to support that. Primarily, that turn to the better was because um, of some further budget cuts, some financial modeling, as well as a slightly better forecast of revenues from the CU Leeds Business School um, over the, that time period, which gave us just a little bit more wiggle room. Also gave us enough room of interest to summon this, um, um, summon this room to move the State Highway 119 capital funding and capital commitment back within the six years of the strategic budget plan. It had moved to 2024. We were able to move it back to 2023. And the board did recommend in committee um, approval of both of those actions. Longer term, there's still challenges. The long term plan still posits um, the use of base system dollars to support fast tracks longer term, but those, as Heather noted, can change. Last night, the RTD Board of Directors also recommended 
um, a modified set of service adjustments for the January service changes that RTD will um, be undertaking and specifically of interest as a relevance to fast tracks. We heard from a lot of stakeholders. We heard from a lot of citizens and others throughout the metro area regarding the proposed cuts in the R line through Aurora and the W line, Lakewood, actually the um, portion between the Federal Center and Jefferson County Government Centers. Pleased to report that the RTD staff took into consideration that feedback and that information and modified the proposal um, to something that I think is much more palatable and workable for most of our stakeholders and citizens. Re retains our line, Aurora operations, basically as is, while cutting them on operations on the weekends from 15 minutes to 30 minutes, but continue service all the way from Lincoln Avenue to Peoria and Smith and also limits the W line cuts to um, Saturday evening, Sunday, and evenings. So a lot less drastic cuts on those lines than had been proposed previously. Um, taking into account ridership, revenues, costs, um, and coming up with a, probably a more balanced and palatable project we'll see, or um, proposal, we'll see. Those are the two main topics that I wanted to hit on because I've been getting a lot of interest from this board and from our citizens and the public. And I wanted to go on record since last month I kind of chastised RTD for the R-Line. Uh, I wanted to go on record thanking the RTD board for their reconsideration. Um, I have to admit I'm a little bit disappointed still in the service cuts for the weekend because that affects uh, retail workers and restaurant workers and uh, people that probably rely on public transportation more than than most but I'm very appreciative of the fact that that the citizens of Aurora and uh, elected officials spoke and RTD listened and uh, and it's a as you said very well a much more palatable option so thank you director Jones and I would like to uh, make a similar um, statement from folks in Boulder County who are very, very concerned about the 119 funding. And we're happy that it's in this plan so that we can move forward with that. So thank you for that. Director Atchison. Yeah, Bill, I know you and I talked after the RTC meeting yesterday. And uh, most all of us can't avoid hearing about the A-Line, the Federal Rail Authority, the PUC. Uh, as you and I were talking before the board meeting yesterday, uh, we've gotten some relief from FRA. The PUC originally originally rejected that finding. As indicated publicly, they're going to reassess those findings that might allow the flaggers to go away and we could get into a better mode of operation and start significant testing on the goal line. Anything new since yesterday morning? At the no. PUC is still quiet as as far as I understand and I haven't received a, an update as of today but as far as I understand PUC is still deliberating on that and we have no no news to report is there anything that we can do to help encourage the PUC to get off their butts yeah I think at this point that could potentially be perceived by some as a uh, counterproductive act um, action. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, we have a couple of informational items under attachment I and attachment J. If you haven't looked at them, I would, would encourage you to do so. Our next meeting is November 15th right here. Uh, other matters by members. There is one thing I wanted to mention uh, in reference to our new executive director. Tomorrow morning there will be a press release sent out and I wanted to specifically point out that it does talk to the fact that we had four very qualified candidates that interviewed for the position and thanking them for their time to, that they took to to come here and interview and that we did feel that uh, Doug w you know rose above by a considerable margin and we're very happy to have him on board although in this digital age that we live 
we have a press release tomorrow, but it's already on Facebook and Twitter. So uh, it's it, yeah, it's out. It's on Dr. Cog's Facebook and Aaron Brockett's Twitter. So uh, <laughs> it, it, at the at the very least, it's in those places. D Director Kanich. It, it, it is November first, yes. Uh huh. So if there's nothing else, we are adjourned at eight fifty four.